So, okay, the mic's working. Excellent. There is a, an ancient Greek saying that uh, if you need a difficult job done, a hard job done, then you find somebody lazy to do it because that guy would figure out an easy way to do that, right? So, um, yeah, that's, a, I think, a good example of uh, how to do stuff. Now, if you're uh, lazy, but you're also smart, you're probably a software developer. And uh, if you also get some funding, any crazy prototype ideas like that, you can probably turn into a product, right? So what I'm trying to, what I'll be trying to show you today is how to use uh, OpenStack Trove, which is the database API for OpenStack and jQuouts. And we had a nice intro talk by uh, Everett yesterday. Um, how to use those two to make your lives easier. Um, so some introductions. My name is uh, Zach Scholev. Um, you can find me on IRC on Freenode as uh, Zach SH. I hang out in the jQuouts channel pretty much all the time. And if you have any questions about jQuouts, I'll try to answer them in that channel. And uh, most of you can ask them now. You know, that also works. Uh, Twitter handle, Zach Scholev. And of course, email, first name, last name at trackspace.com. Um, yes, I work for Axpace. It's uh, the open cloud company. Uh, specifically, I work for the developer relations group, which means that in addition to working on the Java SDKs, and our official SDK is the Apache jQuouts project, um, I also sometimes go to talks like this, and it's uh, quite a lot of fun. So the goals for today, we'll talk a little bit about the cloud in general. So in case you missed the talk yesterday, that would cover some of the same uh, points. Uh, we'll talk about jQuouts. And then I'll show you how to create a database in the cloud. We'll be using uh, the Rackspace cloud databases, which has the same API as OpenStack Trove. And then we'll talk about abstractions in general, the jCloud's architecture around abstractions, and then how to contribute. So the cloud, well, um, it's kind of a charged buzzword, right? But it's just networked and distributed computing that people decided it's a good idea to sell, and obviously it is. Um, and we have a variety of services. When we talk about the cloud, it's basically a bunch of APIs, like uh, compute, if you want to run virtual machines, you want to store, store files, you have that, even email, right? Uh, and databases, which is what we'll be talking about today. Um, there's a couple ways to categorize cloud services. Um, this is a slide that you saw yesterday, if you were at that talk. Um, we are probably mostly in uh, the middle between these two. We also do run the private uh, or help people run that. Um, the other way to categorize those services is uh, that you can have a public cloud where uh, your external provider, somebody you pay, will take care of uh, a bunch of the things that you want to be taken care of. And then you can have your own private cloud, which is actually something that I uh, used to run for a while in my previous job. We're using OpenStack. So OpenStack, again, OpenStack is the, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but that's the open, open source cloud OS that you can run yourself. And Rackspace actually runs that too. And of course, we have the hybrid cloud where you can combine the two. I think this is the most efficient way to run cloud services, the hybrid one. The reason for that being is that most projects that you will work on, and that, that's, that's something that I've actually done, uh, you will have some kind of base load. So you will have a bunch of uh, computations that you have to do every week or every day, and you need a bunch of machines to run them, but sometimes you gotta run something extra. So for example, one good example of this would be if you run data processing, or a bunch of data processing, you have ongoing real-time data processing for your dashboards or what have you, uh, but sometimes your data model might change, in which case you might want to reprocess all your uh, immutable data store. Um, and that takes a while, and it's very expensive, in which case, usually you burst to the public cloud. And that saves you money, because you don't burst all the time, but when you do, well, you need it. Uh, in the case of jQuouts, this is where it sits. It's the SDK, right? Um, and then you have a series of pipes, and also known as the internet, and then you have the cloud. Uh, and obviously a bunch of APIs, and where you can run jQuouts. Well, jQuouts is Java, right? So it's portable. Um, you can run it really any place you want. Um, and we have some of those listed. So some advantages and disadvantages about using the cloud that I wanted to talk about. 
um, pay as you go, it seems like this would reduce your cost a lot. Sometimes that is the case. That is not always the case, though. Um, project scalability. Supposedly unlimited. That's what they'll tell you. I have used a cloud provider for a while. And it's true that you can scale really easily. But obviously, then you pay a lot more. So your bills can increase exponentially, which is probably something that you'll be happy about. But that's uh, a little bit difficult to measure early on. Uh, it's safer. If your office explodes, you still have your data available. And then, of course, you get specific economies of scale that I don't think people talk much about. And those are the expertise and support that you can get from some cloud providers. I really want to say, like, Rackspace. Because if you have certain specific issues that you, can, you don't have the knowledge base to solve, you can ask people, or your cloud provider in this case, and they usually have seen that before. If you're doing your own thing, you're still solving problems that somebody has seen before, but you don't act, have access to that information. The disadvantages, of course, I think the big one is uh, less hardware control. Uh, and the bigger one, provider walk-in. The less hardware control, of course, you have downtime and virtualization. Virtualization, I always think of it as inefficiency. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about virtualization with uh, cloud databases. There's some workarounds around that that Frackspace does, which are kind of interesting. Um, provider downtime, not really anything you can do about. And then provider, wa provider walk-in. Um, there's provider-specific APIs and SDKs and features that each provider has. And that would, if you don't design your project keeping this in mind, it is very, very costly to switch to a private cloud solution or switch to a different cloud. I've done that. So the project that I was working on before, we were using a cloud provider and we wanted to switch to a hybrid cloud where we had most of the base computation, base load in, uh, in house and then just burst through the public cloud. That turned out to be very expensive to do and took many, many, many hours to do. And it's something that you should keep in mind. Um, the way to minimize this uh, disadvantage would be to use JClouds. So that's what I really want to drive through. It's possible in a lot of use cases to use JClouds and JClouds abstraction layers. And the know-how that you obtain while working with JClouds to switch between providers as needed. Um, so let's talk a little bit about OpenStack. So OpenStack is a cloud operating system. It's open source. There's actually, I think, a convention coming up next month. And it was open sourced by Rackspace and NASA 2010. It's free to use. You can download it. There's actually a, a dev distribution that you can use for testing, dev stack, that you can download to your local machine and just around with the APIs. It's pretty much fully functional API-wise. Just you can you know, boot VMs on a VM if you want, or you know, try databases out, storage, and whatnot. Uh, or you can just run it in a small cluster setup, or even your own data center. Um, and there's a bunch of companies that support that, of course. So in the beginning, Crackspace was doing most of the open source contributions to OpenStack. Now we probably do about 30%, I want to say. And we have a lot of uh, big companies that uh, do, you know, it, it's, it's not one big company that contributes to that. It's a bunch of uh, big ones. Um, so databases, uh, very data, much big. Uh, we have um, a lot of discussion around big data recently. And big data is really hyped up. We're not going to talk about big data as much today. We're mostly going to talk about uh, transactional databases, uh, this is the database API. This, this is what the OpenStack uh, Trove API is really um, designed around. So if you want to start up a transactional database such as MySQL maybe, um, or even something like Redis or Postgres, that would be the API that would use with, within OpenStack to do it. It would start a single instance on which you can run a, mo a, a set of databases and a set of users. Um, and that, that's uh, what we'll be talking about. Um, so there's a, a bunch of database-specific advantages. 
which are completely separate from the advantages that you get from running virtual machines in the cloud. And those are that the databases that you run in the cloud would be optimized by your provider, um, such as settings, like memory settings, um, caching settings, Container virtualization would also be optimized, which means that um, the database would not necessarily be virtualized the way a regular virtual machine would be. Um, you get automated software updates. You get the redundant data storage that otherwise you would have to set up somehow. You optionally get backup. You get migration from other databases. And of course, you get the support. So a lot of uh, nice goodies to have, which all goes to show that, you know, fine, if, if you're lazy and you're, you're smart, maybe you should be using something like this because you don't want to really deal with that. You want to be writing in code for your uh, users. Um, and this is also where JCloud uh, comes in. So it's the cloud SDK. It's an Apache project. It's Java and, of course, Clojure and all the JVM uh, languages. Um, it's fairly easy to use, of course, portable. We used to put a lot of... Um, um, you know, thought into making it cloud agnostic, and that's uh, one big portion of it, I guess. Uh, if you use the abstraction layers, the abstraction layers would usually support a multitude of clouds. The big abstraction layers that we use in JClouds would be the compute abstraction layer and uh, also the storage abstraction layer. Those are probably the ones that people use the most. Uh, and I'll talk about the database abstraction layer as well later on. Um, we have a fairly big community. If you visit the JCloud's channel on IRC, we always have a bunch of people on. Um, a lot of uh, committers are on pretty much at any time of day. Um, and we have a bunch of users, some of which are at this conference, and that then they might have mentioned us. Um, so what does actually JCloud's do for you that you don't want to do yourself? Of course, the HTTP requests, responses, and retries is needed. Uh, it takes care of authentication and re-authentication. In some cases, uh, the API service that you use would uh, expire whatever tokens or logins you use, and JClouds would ensure that re-authenticating into that service is completely transparent for you. It takes care of pagination. Uh, a lot of services would not return full data set. They will only return a subset of uh, something that you list. Uh, it takes care of polling, um, not all calls that you do to a service would uh, return the result that you want right away, and you might have to wait for it, and JClouds will take care of that for you. Uh, rate limits. Some clouds would uh, limit how many requests you can do to their services, and JClouds knows about that, and will ensure that you get throttled properly so, then get, so you don't get blocked by that uh, provider. Uh, retries, I mentioned. Um, abstractions, I mentioned. And of course, we have modular logging, and hopefully, when you use JClouds, you also get the side benefit of uh, using a lot less code to accomplish what you want. Uh, and of course, when you combine the two, you get into the, that can somebody else do it mentality, where you don't want to reinvent the wheel, which is probably the most wasteful thing you can do as a software developer. As long as you can find somebody else who hopefully used open source to solve your problem, right? You should use that. Um, and now, We'll, I'm going to showcase some uh, database code with JClouds. We'll talk about best practices and why things are done the way they're done in JClouds, maybe. And perhaps some gotchas, specifically with uh, databases and trying to run the examples and uh, abstractions again. So some requirements. We do run Maven 3 usually. You don't necessarily have to use it. It's super helpful if you do. Uh, Java 6 Plus, uh, Everett mentioned yesterday, we're probably be moving to Java 7 at some point, and we won't be supporting Java 6, but that hasn't happened yet, which is why I'm saying Java 6 plus. Um, JClouds, of course, and then because Java, um, you know, you can use uh, any of those uh, OSs that Java supports. Uh, and again, we'll be talking specifically about databases. We're actually going to mention load balancers a bit. Um, and then specifically OpenStack and Rackspace. Uh, so we'll be using the Rackspace uh, Cloud Databases provider. So the provider is called Cloud Databases. The API is uh, Trove, OpenStack Trove. Um, and uh, technically, we also have a 
provider and an API for, uh, I think, the Amazon databases. But we'll talk about that a little bit later. So this is what we'll be going through. Um, I'll talk about you know, setting up the skeleton project uh, and then initializing and then all of those other steps. So first off, the Maven dependencies. Um, we make it easy to do a very selective subset of everything that's available in JClouds. Um, there is versioning available, including snapshots, which are easily obtainable. So if you want to use the very, very latest bleeding edge, perhaps somewhat unstable snapshot, you could. You could use older versions. It's, it's really nice. And um, I, I should probably mention JCloud's labs. Uh, so specifically for um, some of the newer uh, providers and APIs, we have, for OpenStack, we have something called JCloud's OpenStack Labs. Uh, some of, in, of the code in labs is actually production ready. Um, but it's, when, when we say labs, we probably mean more uh, add-ons and extensions to JCloud's. It's not, not, not all the code there is not production ready. Yeah. Okay, so the Maven POM, we actually have the full example here, uh, if you want to have a look. But the important parts that you can get out of this, if you're just running the database examples, uh, would be the Rackspace Cloud Databases US provider. So this artifact here is what you would want. Uh, the transient dependencies that you get out of it would be uh, the API, which is OpenStack 12, and JCloud's core, and a couple other small things such as uh, Juice, Guava, and um, JSON, stuff that JCloud's depends on. Now, the reason we have the second dependency here, the MySQL connector dependency, is that once we get the database up and running, we would want to test and see um, if we can actually connect to it. And that's pretty much the whole reason this is here. Um, I, I wanted to say a few words about logging in JClouds uh, because I mentioned it before, and I think it's important because it would make your lives much, much easier. This is the way you set it up. So you uh, have a list of modules. In this case, we use the SL uh, for uh, JWogging module. Um, and um, the way you pass this module is that you just give it uh, here when you say modules, and then you build your uh, context. We'll talk about this more later. But what this means is that you can plug in a bunch of different modules uh, in this uh, context creation call. The configuration for logging, I think this is important. I wanted to mention that. Uh, we have something called the wire file. When you set this up, all the HTTP requests that JClouds would do to a particular service would get logged to a file. And if for some reason you hit a bug that you think is JClouds, looking into that file would really tell you what's going on. I, I think this is probably the most helpful part of uh, logging, at least for me. It's been really, really helpful. Every time I have to debug anything with JClouds, this is, this is where you start. So initializing the API. Uh, the API is the Trove API, the OpenStack Trove API. It's uh, completely compatible with Rackspace and also HP and pretty much anybody else who would be using uh, an OpenStack cloud. And the way we initialize it is that we'll give it the provider name. And the provider is really doesn't, it doesn't have much code in it. It will pretty much have an endpoint, which tells it to use the Rackspace cloud. And of course, your credentials. And then you tell it which API to build. Now, this context uh, will contain a bunch of things that you'll be using later on. And it will save all of that, of course, for you. Um, then. If you want to get a particular API uh, for a particular database API out of that uh, Trove API, you, the way you do it in JClouds is pretty much following this model. Get name of the API for a particular zone. So the zone or location, as it's known in general in JClouds, is pretty much something like uh, US West or something like that. All right? It specifies the geographical region that you want to use. In the case of uh, Rackspace, we have um, like a Chicago data center and uh, Dallas-Fort Worth data center, stuff like that. So fairly simple. 
Now, the Trove API only has four, I guess I'll call them sub-APIs, and then uh, utils. And that's pretty much it. You have the Flavor API. Now, Flavor is uh, the hardware specifications of uh, the machine that you want to run your databases on. The Instance API is what lets you boot up that virtual VM that holds your databases. And the Database API is what allows you to start up a particular database on that instance. And the User API lets you create users that have access to your databases. And the Utils has like one or two methods that help you simplify some of the exception handling and uh, stuff like that. So creating the instance is fairly easy. First, you need to get the flavor, because when you boot up the instance, you need to tell it what kind of hardware you want it to run on. So the way we do it here is just we pick up the first flavor in the list that jclouds gets us using the flavor API.list call, and we'll just pass it here, right? And then we have the size, usually volume size in gigabytes. This is how much data space you want to have for your database, and then the name of the uh, database instance. So this is the polling part that I talked about earlier. You say a, a weight available, you'd give it the instance, and you give it the instance API. And what jclouds will do for you is that it will qu query the service until the status of that database is ready. The, the reason for this is that when you talk to this particular API, you tell it, well, boot me up a database service, right? And it might take some time, might take half a minute, might take a couple of minutes, depending on the data center. So this is what this takes care of for you. And yeah, this is, it, it will pull. So the actual code, including all the exception handling, if you want to do that yourself, is a little bit much. So instead, we get this uh, get working instance uh, uh, code in the utilities. And pretty much all you do is uh, give it the zone, name, flavor, ID, and size. And what this will do for you is that it will say, create me an instance. Then if for some reason any of those steps fail, it will delete the instance, retry it until you get a, a working instance. So it might take a little bit longer, but, you don't, but if you just want to get a working instance and you don't care about what happens in the background while you do that, you just call that. So once you have the instance up and running, you want to create a database. Again, of course, you, have, you get the Trove API, you get the instance API after that. And this is a very common model uh, for how we get things done in jclouds is that the way you get the database API, you get it by using the Trove API, but you tell it, give me the database API for that instance API. So get some API for X and Y and Z. That's fairly common in jclouds. In this case, get me the database API for a particular zone and this instance. So this means that all calls that you do to this database API here would refer also to that particular instance that you created. So if you do something like create a new database, the database would be created on this instance. And of course, this means you can have multiple databases on that instance, and that's part of the API. Um, creating, yes? So this uh, get instance dot get ID. It's not used here, we just get it. The instance is used over here, sorry if you can't see it. Yes, um, over here. So it's actually the, the get instance. I should have specified this here, but uh, the get instance is just pretty much uses the instance API to, it, it's a little bit unclear, I'm sorry. It's the same yes, yes it is. And this is where actually we use the database API so from the previous page. We just say create and use a name, which is in this case a constant in the example. It results, it, it results in a true or false uh, variable. Uh, sorry, yes? Sorry yeah. It's actually Trove Utility. Yes. Yes. Uh, and we, so in, in here we'll use the same pattern uh, to get the user API. So the user API is the user API for a particular zone and instance, and then you will create users that work on that particular instance. And a little bit, what's a little bit different here is that 
you will specify the database name in uh, this uh, user API call. Uh, and, and that's pretty much it. You have the name, password, and the database name for the user that you create. Yes? Well, this is pretty much how, uh, unfortunately, I have to say that this is pretty much how uh, it was designed. It's just um, a model, and we try to keep it consistent. The zone? Uh, no. You can have. Um, yes. Uh, in this call right here, it can be, but it probably won't work if you do a different zone. Does this make sense? Okay. So and that, that, that was pretty much it. We created everything, and we just want to test it. And now th this is a little bit tricky, but I wanted to go over it. Uh, we do need the load balancer to test this. And this is something that might surprise you when you're trying the example um, for the first time. The reason for this is that when you create a database, using the database API is the database will not be immediately accessible from the internet. And the reason for this is that pretty much like 9,500% of uh, the way those databases would be used would be from an application that runs on the cloud. So you can connect to that database from the cloud, or in this case the Rackspace cloud, but you can't connect to it directly from uh, outside cloud. And that's mostly security reasons, I think. So there's two ways to connect to it. You can create a server, like a, maybe a web server that talks to it and just displays something. We can just do a load balancer. And I think this is the simpler way to do it here. So we create a load balancer using jQuouts. Um, it's fairly easy. You just give it the name. You say the protocol, in this case MySQL, the port for the protocol. Just one, we only have one node, so this is why the algorithm is random. It doesn't really matter and you make it public, and this add nodes actually refers to the um, ID and IP address, the private IP address of that cloud database that you'll be connecting to. Um, this is pretty much the call once you have this, this object. And now again, this is really common in jQuouts. When you connect, when you talk to the jQuouts APIs, you will use the builder pattern in Java to create an immutable object that you pass to those APIs. Um, so this is, this is really common. You, you work on your object first, you build it, and then you pass it to the particular call that you want to make. And then this is just really standard uh, JDBC connection handling in uh, MySQL and Java that you can use. And the way we do it is that the database name uh, would be provided in the connect, connection string, the username, and then the password and you will connect to the load balancer by getting the uh, virtual IP of that load balancer. Uh, and of course, using the MySQL protocol. And that's how you will test it. And now, what we actually run on this uh, database in the example is just a very simple select three plus five query, which would return eight if the database is up and running. So you don't actually need to create any tables or anything to see that it's working. Um, so pretty simple uh, for reference. You can, you, know, you can see all of that. I, I'll go back to this, but this is part of the examples. You can see how to actually compile and run all of that code. Uh, and I have some links, such as the actual jQuouts examples. We have Rackspace examples under that. Uh, we have a little bit more documentation. Uh, if you don't want to use Maven, we have some alternatives to that. And if you want to contribute, you can uh, see how this link. And uh, something about, I want to talk a little bit about going forward, right? Uh, the Trove API under Rackspace, we have something called extensions. And this is the backup extensions and the setting ex ex settings extensions certain, uh, recently became available. So we are completely compatible with the Trove API, the OpenStack Trove API, and we have some extensions that are specific to Rackspace. So we'll probably be working on that. Then, of course, there is the abstraction layer. This is something that I want to cover in a little bit more depth. Uh, this is a regular ar architecture of how things would work in jQuouts. You will have your provider, which is the most specific thing, right? And it contains a few settings, such as the endpoint. And then as the level of abstraction increases, you have uh, Trove, which is the actual implemented API code in jQuouts. And you have 
we don't have actually, we don't have that yet, but you have something like jQuery's database, which allows you to talk to all the different APIs. Uh, and this is, of course, not implemented yet. And this is why we need people to help out and contribute, right? So who implements uh, different, so, so the co companies and providers right now that implement uh, some kind of a transactional database APIs would be companies like Rackspace, Microsoft, Amazon, Salesforce, CouchDB. And of these, uh, I think we have support right now for Rackspace and Amazon in jQuery. We want to get provider support for the rest of those and then work, or before that, on the abstraction layer. But of course, for that, we need teamwork and collaboration, right? Um, and if you want to help out, these are two more links for you to check out. Uh, if you're interested in adding provider code, and if you have some ideas, there's people online all the time that can help you out with uh, best practices or where to start, and even actual coding questions if needed. Uh, and by the way, uh, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Everett, who's giving a documentation talk this afternoon, how to do a walk-up contribution to uh, open source documentation. Uh, what, what time is that? 1.30. So uh, thank you, and I want to open it up for questions. If you have anything specific you want to ask, yes. Uh, is this just for databases? Not necessarily. So, yes. I mean, Mongo is interesting. It's usually any type of a non cluster database that you would. Yes, yes. and a bunch of other things as well. Yeah. Like for example, I think Postgres is also something that's in the works. Cassandra so would. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, sure. Actually, I can answer that. Um, so Cassandra would probably be covered under a, a different uh, API, which would be Autoscale, uh, not Autoscale, but um, Big Data. I think actually. Uh, it, it will be it will be supported in jQuery, but it won't be under OpenStack Trove. It will be a different API. Yes. But it will still be under OpenStack. Yes, okay. probably okay. eventually. This gets a little bit complex because there's a couple of different APIs that support stuff like that. And I think Rackspace will have a different API than OpenStack, and I think both will be supported, actually, if I want to be completely detailed. And right now, I think yes. It doesn't exist now. Yeah. Sorry, it's not. It does not exist. But that's, that's in the work. That's the plan, I guess, the long term plan. All right, any other questions? No? No, thank you.